So I lead a, a few teams in machine learning and data science in Microsoft. So we have about uh, close to 10,000 people doing machine learning and data science inside Microsoft in various products, all the way from uh, um, uh, search and advertising and products like Xbox and Kinect and Office and uh, Skype and Hotmail and pretty much everything that you can think of now. So pretty much any page you go, any place you go, yeah, there is some intelligent decision being driven based on data and algorithms driven by machine learning. So as a background, I've been with Microsoft for about three years now. And before that, I was a director of research at Yahoo Labs, where I led a team working on machine learning applications, building machine learning pipelines and intelligent pipelines for uh, various applications in computational advertising. So it was a time when we were birthing the whole Hadoop ecosystem inside Yahoo Labs. And it was an incredible opportunity to build large scale machine learning applications on these pipelines. Going back more than 15 years ago, um, I, was in, I, was, uh, I did my PhD in astrophysics, uh, where I worked on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which basically got me into the field of machine learning and data science, because this was in the late 90s, where we would be collecting about a terabyte of uh, images data, imaging and spectroscopic data. There was no cloud, no analysis of algorithms, so pretty much by, uh, not by choice, but by necessity, we started thinking very deeply about statistical learning methods, data processing, large-scale systems, et cetera. Now, I want to talk to you about data science economy. And, but before we go into the, the, the economic aspects of this, in fact, I probably won't touch on the economic aspects of this to, at all today. I just wanted to give an overview about my personal thoughts about what is the data science economy? How does it look like? Right. and what will drive it. And a lot of these things are my own perceptions based on uh, observing developments over the last 15, 20 years in different fields across machine learning systems, applications in the industry, and uh, birthing solutions, intelligent solutions. So first of all, what is the data science economy? I characterize this pretty broadly as any application, any data-based application, that enhances the human experience. So that's yet another abstract term. What does human experience mean? Basically, any applications that enhances human experience by, say, improving your health or quality of life, anything that has to deal with, say, wearables, for example, that enriches your social and professional relationships, entertainment, applications, data-based services like Facebook, LinkedIn, all fall in this category, that lets you get better education, better knowledge, and satisfies your intellectual curiosity. In any application that uses data in any of these endeavors is part of the data science economy that enriches your travel and communication experiences. So the one drivers, what are the ingredients that go into creating such an applications? Right. Applications that enhance human experience using data using algorithms, using systems, and most of all, with humans. Data and algorithms goes without saying, but you really need systems to be able to use the data, run your algorithms, experiment, deliver the results of your algorithms, the insights, the decisions, using systems. And most importantly, the, biggest, the, the most important ingredient here is humans. Obviously, there are two places that humans play value here. One is, we all know it's very easy as consumers. Right? We all consume a number of these apps in our day-to-day -day lives. But there is one more very important role that humans play here, which is as producers of these apps. They bring in their creativity. They bring in their innovations, start asking questions. Why? What can I do with it? that really trigger and keep this whole, eco this whole economy churning. Okay. Now, how will the whole data science economy look like? I'll share my own thoughts around this. Sorry about this. I think there's something wrong with this. I'm not able to see the slides here properly and the notes properly, do you?
just give me one second while I get this. Okay, I think I got this now. Okay, cool. Now before we do this, before I tell you what a data science economy looks like, let me ask a very simple question. It's probably very unrelated at, at, at first blush, but why do we all have one single central nervous system and one single brain? Why don't we have brains distributed all over our body? Why don't we all have computing nodes situated all over our body? Earthworms have distributed uh, brains. And I think the tentacles and octopus are intelligent to some extent, depending on how you define intelligence. But other than that, pretty much all creatures have a single brain in a cranium in one part of their body. What makes it so special? Why is it that there's only one brain? <coughs> so my take on this is, and, and I think there is some, some evidence to this as well. This is the one place where the data from everything all over the places flows into you. Right. So data from all of your senses, from all of your organs, your interactions with the physical world, everything flows into this one place where all this data now impinges on the memory, the, the past history of all the data that has flowed into your brain, interacts with it, gets processed in the brain, creates memories, creates thoughts, and in this one single place, there is processing, there is data that keeps coming over. There is processing that happens all over again. Intelligence is born here. So this is the one single place because this is, the brain turns out to be the biggest data integration system in the world. It's the one place where all the data from every source, every interaction from your birth to death gets assimilated, gets processed, gets turned into intelligence. And if you look at the mammalian brain, for example, I mean, all the way from amphibians to humans, you'd see that the overall size of the brain has only gone up by a factor of three. And also, all the places that process, that receive the data, the amount of data that a primate receives, I mean, a chimpanzee feels heat, a chimpanzee feels cold, the amount of uh, area in the brain, the amount of volume in the brain that receives and processes this data is very similar. But what has increased, what has really led to this tripling in volume are the amount of interactions on the processing that happens between these regions that are accumulating the data. The regions that are processing these interactions between different parts of the brain is what has really led to the growth of human intelligence. So if you look back at the, say, the last eight, seven, eight million years when we have evolved from chimpanzees to humans, what has really gone on is the amount of the, the amount of the brain that's going to collect the data remains the same, but the amount of brain that's processing these data, that's integrating these data sources through connections. There are now about 10,000 more connections between different parts of the brain than there are neurons in the brain. So it is this connection and the processing that happens by integrating these different data sources that's really led to intelligence. Now, a few years ago, one um, famous venture capitalist, Mark Andreessen, said that uh, the, cloud, uh, the software is eating the world. But in the last three, four years, we see a new phenomena rising. The birth of the cloud. The cloud is eating software. It's turning software into services. The cloud is also eating data. It's eating data, it's eating software, it's applying software on data to turn into intelligence. So really, my perception of what the data science economy, what will drive the data science economy are, is the intelligent cloud. Right? Cloud systems where a lot of data gets integrated, there's a lot of processing that happens that integrates all these data, analyzes the patterns, applies algorithms, and develops intelligence using this data 
the enormous computing and storage capabilities of a cloud and births intelligence. <coughs> so effectively, cloud systems that learn from data and improve with experience are going to power the data science economy, namely the intelligent cloud. Now, that, that was a very high level argument. Let me give some thoughts about why I think the intelligent cloud is evolving right now. I feel there are two main factors that are driving the evolution of the intelligent cloud. One is connected data. The other one is ease of delivery of this intelligence that's born on the cloud. Let me talk about connected data first. Now, this chart here shows the amount of data that is there in the world, in the planet. The x-axis is time, y-axis is the amount of data. In the early, in the, in the mid-80s, all of the data that we had was basically analog. Right? There was data in the form of books, data in the form of uh, tapes, audio tapes, video tapes, data in the form of gramophone records. These were all analog data. There were roughly about two, hundred, two and a half exabytes of it, so about 250 petabytes. That's about it. In the 90s, we started seeing the arrival of digital data. Right? CDs came on the scene, DVDs followed, client-server computing started, so data started becoming more and more digital. In the mid to uh, late 90s, internet came on the scene, digital data really exploded, and around the time of 2000 or so, digital data started overtaking or, or becoming equivalent to analog data. Then, till about 2007, 2008 or so, a new phenomena happened, which is the arrival of the mobile uh, ecosystem, where a lot of the data and, and the growth of a lot of data centers that are collecting this data and are connected to the internet. So suddenly you had an uh, explosion of the digital data. The analog data stayed roughly the same. The top two things, data centers and PC devices, now had one more extremely important characteristic. Namely, they are internet connected. So data now starts having an IP address. You can reach data, you can work with data, you can derive intelligence from data, you can aggregate data from different places, you can connect the data from different sources and start processing them with the massive power of the cloud to start putting together intelligent applications. Now, what's happened today? The cloud, and there's been a whole growth in this, in the space of uh, digital data, especially internet-connected digital data. With the arrival of things like Internet of Things, sensors, mobile, everything, the digital data has continued to explode and grow. The analog data has basically fallen off to zero. And now there is about roughly 10, um, 10 exa, uh, 10 zettabytes, uh, 10 um, zettabytes of data. So roughly 10 million petabytes of data. Right? So we've gone from around 250 petabytes of data to about 10 million petabytes of data, but more than that, more than half of it is internet connected on the cloud that are addressable, connected data. Now let's project it further. By 2020, which is not too far away, in five years, even the non-internet connected data is going to reduce. Most of your data is now going to be in mobile. It's going to live on data centers that are internet connected, that are reachable and addressable. And suddenly, most or more than 95% of the planet's data, information, insights, intelligence is going to live on connected cloud. It's okay to have all this data what is the value of data? It's okay, we, you, you can get to 50 zettabytes of data in like another five years, that's 50 million petabytes, but what is the value and use of this data ultimately? So Joseph Sirosh, uh, who's the VP of Machine Learning Microsoft, has an interesting quote and I thought I will, I will borrow it here and then share it with you. He says, insights and predictions are worth pennies. Decisions 
are worth dollars. This goes back to David's point about decisions driving everything, being the most economical, valuable entity. <coughs> but data itself is useless. So with that, now what do you do with this, all this data? Okay, there are now, it goes to obscene numbers. It's like millions of petabytes, tens of millions of petabytes. Who cares beyond a point? Because at that point, it's going to go into useless realm. What do people do with data? Typically, we have seen people do four things. Right? One is, we do retrospective analysis. You want to analyze what happened in the past, create reports, create dashboards, create insights. And with a lot of computing power in your, in our fingertips, we want to do them faster, you want to do them cheaper. Second time is real-time analytics. You want to do pretty much similar things, but now on data that's flowing in near real time from sensors, from IoT applications, et cetera. You want to analyze what happened. Third one is maybe you want to use the historical data, learn some models, capture the learning, and apply it to predict your future, predictive analytics. All of these things fall into the pennies category. Right. The value of all these three fall into the pennies categories. What really drives value is this last one, intelligent applications using data that can drive decisions. That's the dollars category. That's the one that really creates. The pennies and dollars are more metaphorical, take them relatively. But in terms of relative value, one of those intelligent SaaS apps that drives decisions is probably worth 100 times any of these, the first three three tiles here. The second thing that has happened is the easy delivery of intelligence. It's one thing to have intelligence. It's one thing to be able to model data. It's one thing to be able to derive insights. But how do you use that to, to make decisions and drive the decisions in these applications? Here, let me tell you a story of the connected cow. <laughs> how many of you have heard of the connected cow? Couple of people. Okay. It's a very interesting story, and I thought I would share it broadly because I think it has all the sexy elements you hear now, right? Internet of Things, machine learning, data science, uh, applications, everything. Now, what you see here are cows, right? And look at the look at the instruments at their bottom. These are pedometers that the cows are wearing. Right? These are actual pedometers, wearables for cows. <laughs> and these wearables are Wi-Fi enabled. What they do is they count the number of steps that the cow takes. Right? They're Wi-Fi enabled. They transfer the data to the cloud through some local routers. They come to the Azure cloud. And this has been going on for a while. It's OK now. The cows need to take 10,000 steps a day, too. Well, before I answer that, let me uh, tell you something else. We find that every company we hear, every business we see is at, the, at its core a data company. Even a business like a farming business, one of the oldest traditional businesses you would see is at its core a data business. What do I mean by that? Now, its output, think about the output of a farm, dairy farm. It outputs milk and dairy products. It outputs beef. Right? These are the two main outputs. The farmer's job is to maximize this output with certain constraints. There are constraints on how much cattle he has, how much pastures they have to graze the cattle, how many facilities he has, and most importantly, Human labor, right? How many farm hands is he, does he have access to that he is paid? By the way, farm labor is very expensive. Right? So, what does a dairy farmer, what can he do? Now, it turns out there are two things that a dairy farmer can do, right? And, and this at the core is what a yeah, dairy farming business comes down to. Keep the cattle healthy, prevent health issues, detect health issues early, do vaccinations, medicines, keep the cattle healthy and, uh, and, uh, and productive. Second one is he can improve the cattle production, increase the size of his cattle by accurately detecting estrus. Okay. Now for those of you who remember our high school biology, I certainly didn't, I had to look it up. <laughs> uh, this is when the cow goes into heat, right, and is ready to mate and bat a calf. 
So, it turns out that how you detect the estrus turns out to have a huge impact and basically making sure that there is artificial insemination of the cows at the time that the cows goes into heat or rather gets into the mood mm -hmm. is extremely important to improve the pregnancy rate of the cows. For example, the normal consumption rate is about 70%. Your farmer's manual detection of estrus rates is about roughly 50 to 55%, right? I mean, trained farmers can do this about half the time. And the pregnancy rate is about 40%. But if you can improve the estrus detection rate to something like 95%, it goes up all the way. The pregnancy rate goes up to 67%. So the farmers can basically double, almost improve their cattle production by like two thirds just by simply accurately detecting estrus. Now how does this have to do with data science, data, economy, all those things, cloud, everything. But this accurate detection of estrus turns out to be extremely hard by the way, right? I mean even experienced farmers only get it right half the time. And like what happens in most of these cases, the estrus lasts only for about 12 to 18 hours, once every three weeks. And also, most of these types of activities happen between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. at night, right? When the farmer is very tired after a very hard day's work. Now, how can technology help here? How can farmers tell when the time is right for hundreds of cows? Now, imagine you are a farmer with like 500 cows and you are doing a dairy farm business. What do you do? A farmer in Japan basically asked the question, right? I mean, what can I do? How can I improve the, uh, the efficiency of my detection of estrus? And he asked this question to one of our partners in Fujitsu, right? He basically asked this question to, to some researchers in, in Fujitsu lab who's one of our partners. The Fujitsu lab guys knew that and they went and instrumented the cow, put variables on them, set up a system where through local routers, it's going to a network and lands up in the Microsoft Azure cloud. They built a system that can automatically detect an alert when a cow goes into estrus. Right? Send a mobile alert to the farmer when the cow goes into estrus. Now before I go into the efficiency of this, let me just tell you one secret that let them do this. How do you detect estrus? If, a, if an experienced farmer is not able to do it, how do you know? It turns out that these Fujitsu researchers then went and consulted some academic researchers in the, uh, in the agriculture uh, uh, research community and found that there has been a lot of work, research work done in this very particular topic. Right? Specifically, let's look at this chart. Right? The x-axis here is the time. It goes from around 9 a.m. in the morning on one day to about 5 p.m. the next night. The y-axis is the number of steps that the cow takes, right, as she paces around the farm in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the pastures. The green line here is the number of cows, is the number of steps she takes on a normal day. Right? Note that at night here, there's a relative dip in the number of steps. She's just basically at night taking a nap, right? And this is what happens when she's in estrus. This enormous spike is something that's relatively easy to detect once you put a variable on a cow. Right? And it turns out that the optimal time for artificial insemination is about 16 hours later after she goes into heat. Now, this is an incredibly powerful tool. It's a very simple tool birthed on the cloud with the Internet of Things where now you can alert the farmer saying that, hey, your cow goes into heat and 16 hours from now set your alarm to do artificial insemination. It turns out that this is accurate about 95% of the time. The remaining 5% of the time is also very important. These are the time when the cow skips the farm and runs away. <laughs> right? Or has, uh, and Fujitsu researchers also found that there are about eight different diseases that the cow might have when she starts pacing around very fast. 
Now, all of these things are factors that are extremely important for a farmer to be alerted on. So you better send an alert to the farmer as soon as you start seeing this increase in the number of steps. Now, this can help the farmer increase the amount of, increase the number of calves. But there is one other extremely interesting phenomena that the Fujitsu research has found out. It turns out that there is a window of fertility around the, the 16 hours. If you inseminate a little bit earlier, there's a very high probability of the calf being female. You inseminate a little later, you wait and inseminate a little later, it's about, there's a higher probability of getting a female. So suddenly now the farmer has two livers in his control that he has never had in their entire 2000, 3000 history, years of history of farming. The farmer gets to control, the farmer gets to increase the calf production by taking, a, he, he or she can plan how much to increase the calf production. Number two, depending on the products they want to sell, whether it's uh, milk and dairy products or whether it's beef, they can control the balance of cows, male cows versus female cows versus bulls. So finally, let me just go through what will drive the data science economy. Right? So we've just now talked about the data science economy, how, I mean, that was an application, the, farm, the connector cow was an application that used data that was only possible because you could send the data, you can instrument the cows, there's internet of things, you could send the data to the cloud, analyze it in the cloud, push the results back to the farmers, so deliver that intelligence back to the farmer. Now what will drive the data science economy? Let me ask a simple question here. How many of you are wearing tailored, custom tailored shirts today? Where you went to a tailor, took clothes, got it stitched. Nobody. But 50 years ago, nobody, right? Basically nobody here. 50 years ago, at the time of our parents and grandparents, they used to go to the store, buy clothes, go to a tailor, get themselves measured, get clothes stitched, which might take a week, get your clothes back, and if you don't like it, too bad. What do you do now? You go to a clothing retail store, you have this enormous marketplace, you have this enormous collection of clothes, various sizes, shapes, designs, colors. You pick one that you like, check it out in less than half an hour, the whole process takes half an hour. There's maybe some gender bias there, but it's about half an hour. <laughs> but after that, if you don't like it, you go return it and pick another one. You have this incredible vast collection of clothes in a marketplace. So what changed? What really changed in this last 50 years? Why did we go from such an expensive, cost inefficient, subpar human experience to something where you feel that this is no longer your, you know, something that you think about or plan about? Same thing with Amazon, right? I mean, you go to Amazon, they have like a billion products, literally. Right? You pretty much get everything you need on Amazon. Go there, click, and you pay for it. It's a huge marketplace. Now, in data science, in machine learning, in intelligence, what changed? Why don't we have like a million APIs? Why don't we have a billion APIs? A billion APIs, intelligent APIs, that can do whatever you want, whether it's churn, whether it's hospital readmissions, whether it's recommendations, whether it's text analytics, whether it's uh, Internet of Things, whether it's predictive maintenance. So, but we now see, so basically what changed is the whole, it became very easy to mass merchandise, to mass market, to mass produce a lot of these clothes. Right? You no longer had to be, had to think about making these choices up front. It can be a very delayed decision. Right? That choice is going to be extremely important even in, just like you have a marketplace like this. Can't you have a marketplace like this? APIs. APIs for speech, APIs for vision, APIs for text, recommendations, churn predictions. So my hypothesis is we are evolving to a world that's powered by an intelligent cloud that's going to be driven by a marketplace of intelligent APIs 
that can solve any data-driven decision-making problem you care about. And I think it's up to us as the community to birth this, this ecosystem and this economy. Now, how many of you have seen this site, How Old Dot? Probably about 75, 80% of you. Right? This grew out of an API in the marketplace. A face detection, a gender detection, and a age detection API in the marketplace. So we put out this marketplace a month ago. And in a single day, some enterprising developer came up with this mashup to start throwing together a marketplace like this. And just this morning, I saw that there were 300 million photos that have been uploaded to this by about 50 million users. Yeah. And I found some interesting things as well, like this Mrs. Dogfire image before and after, turning out from a male of 42 to a female of 50. <laughs> there are some really interesting images as well. <laughs> So my hypothesis is we are evolving and we are birthing a data science economy that's powered by an intelligent cloud. A cloud that turns hardware into software, turns software into services running on the cloud. A cloud that uses these services with data to create intelligence and delivers that intelligence through a set of cloud-hosted APIs in a marketplace. Thank you. EJ, I time to unplug. I'm up too soon. Go to Q&A. Couple minutes. Hi. Um, so, with with clouds like Azure and, and AWS, you know all the security concerns are being handled by the, by you guys, and then a lot of partners are taking advantage of the APIs and creating products around that. So, do you see uh, in, in this future of, of API enabled clouds of, of of monetizing, so charging for APIs? Is that something that Microsoft already does? Totally. Right. So. Yes, the short answer is yes. Right. It's, a, it's a marketplace of, inter I mean, you, we are used to marketplaces for clothes, for products. Amazon does it. We're used to marketplaces for music. Apple does it. We're used to marketplaces for apps. Right. Apple does it, Google does it, Microsoft does it, everybody does it. Why don't we have a marketplace of intelligent APIs, an API where there are a billion APIs that you can call with, with, a, with a REST API? all the way from a mobile phone or a laptop or a cloud or anywhere in the world where intelligence is accessible to you. Data and intelligence is accessible to you through a, through a HTTP call. You're absolutely right. And this is a marketplace where there are two players. There is obviously consumers, developers who build these apps, build these intelligent apps. And there are producers, right, where you can, if you are, say, for example, the expert in analyzing soil and sand and, and seeing whether there is oil in the sand, you should be able to bring that IP, bring that knowledge, put it out as an API on the cloud and be able to monetize it. And we offer that. Right? So you can, put a, you can build an API in Azure Machine Learning, host it as an API on the cloud. It comes with very high SLAs, great throughput, high layers, very low latency, fault tolerant, accessible from anywhere in the world, and you can monetize it in about 100 different currencies now. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but what's your take on an application for that cow problem that is that really, are we really solving a problem or are we creating another problem? Because in a short term, yes, we are answering or we are solving this problem of profitability for a farmer. But 
it makes me think that are we interfering with the natural process of survival or birth control or um, what are we really doing in the long term? Great philosophical question, one that I'm mostly <laughs> equipped to answer. But artificial insemination is already happening, right? We are not doing anything different from, from that process. It's on the detection of the estrus using a variable that you put on the, on the, on the cow, which is no different from putting on teeth and hooves on, on horses. That's where I think this is, uh, at least that application is about. But you're absolutely right. There are philosophical and ethical questions around this that needs to be thought through. Thank you.